state of Andhra Pradesh. However, this Kovina is open to everyone who is interested or enthusiastic or volunteering to various services under COVID-19. The intention of AP Kovina is to strengthen the doctors with knowledge to respond confidently and professionally to treat COVID-19 patients and thus help reduce mortality in Andhra Pradesh. I'm Dr. Vinod Kumar. I'm project director, AP Health System Strengthening Project. Commissioner APUP as additional charge and the state nodal officer for clinical management protocol. I welcome all the participants. I request all the participants henceforth to join 15 minutes early and maintain the Zoom etiquettes to familiarize yourself beforehand with the Zoom, to participate with video on preferably. I request participants not to share your screen and not to write anything on the screen. Participants are requested not to attend if you are driving. And if you have any technical support needed or any issues with the technical things on the Zoom, kindly put your queries in the chat box. Somebody from the technical team will reach out to you and it will be resolved. And please post any questions if you have, if you want to be answered it in the course of the webinar. Some questions which are burning and you cannot stop till the end and we request participants to come up with what are the topics you would want to know want to hear about in the upcoming webinars kindly also do not forget to give your feedback in the chat box at the end so that we can improvise on this capacity building initiative of the state of Andhra Pradesh. i welcome the speakers i request speakers to keep their ppts ready if you are going to share the ppt and I also request the speakers to give your feedback to the moderator of this session. There are uh, around 200 people joining right now. And we have made one important change since the last uh, COVID. -19. That is, we will be providing certificates for the participants. You have to register yourself uh, through the link provided to you. And once you're registered with the, with the, with the mail ID, the, if you are participating till the end, then the certificate of participation from the government of Andhra Pradesh will be sent to your email ID. And having said that, if you are not registered, the link will help you to register. And if you're already registered for the upcoming webinars, the link for that webinar will be directly sent to you on the email. So kindly do not forget to check your email for the upcoming webinars, and the link is also directly provided to you. Now I request Dr. P. V. Sudhakar, who is the moderator of the session and the principal of Andhra Medical College, to start the webinar. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Um, and uh, good evening, all my friends over here in India, and a very good morning to those uh, who are from United States. And I'm very glad that um, the responsibility of conducting this AP webinar has been bestowed on. Uh, Andhra Medical College Vishakhapatnam and uh, Dr. Vinod Kumar who spoke to you just now he is uh, not only a doctor, medical doctor but he is also an, in, an officer in the Indian Administrative Service. He is holding a very important portfolio in the state of Andhra Pradesh to, in dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, he will be issuing guidelines day in and day out uh, so that they will serve as already recognized for all of us to deal with the COVID-19 management. Now in India, we are seeing a lot of cases of uh, mucormycosis and uh, particularly in uh, patients who had suffered from the COVID-19 and who got discharged. And we have uh, these figures in the double digits and um, in King George Hospital in Vishakhapatnam and as well as in the other areas, we are having more and more number of these. And we thought that it is pertinent to give uh, some idea about this management of the mucormycosis by the experts in this field. So we have conducted a couple of days back uh, the basics of the mucormycosis by the, the microbiologist point of view as well as the ENT surgeon and the oculoplastic surgeon spoke on the other day. And now that uh, we want to know something about the management of mucormycosis. So this capacity building or empowering all our doctors with the knowledge is a continuous process and the government of Andhra Pradesh is very serious about this. 
So we have uh, a very distinguished speakers today and uh, first of all I wish to introduce Dr. Richard Sindrich who is an assistant professor of medicine Mount Sinai School of Medicine and director infectious diseases and HIV clinics Bronx Care Health System New York and he will be talking to us on the treatment of mucormycosis and he had his training from University of Iowa and University of California and I wish to thank my good friends in America Dr. Sridhar Chilamuri of Bronx Care as well as Dr. Kairam Ramohan for making this possible and by facilitating uh, the speaker to come and join us this evening. And we have two other speakers uh, after Dr. Sindrich, Dr. B. Devi Madhavi will be speaking on the prevention of mycosis. She is a community medicine expert and she is a professor and head of the department of community medicine at Andhra Medical College. She is the sheet anchor in most of the clinical trials that we conduct in Andhra Medical Colleges. She is very, uh, very much into the research of the uh, activity of this college. And uh, subsequent to Dr. Devi Madhavi, it is Dr. D.S. Murthy, uh, Associate Professor of Microbiology, Rangaraya Medical College, Kakinada, who will be talking on infection control practices in the hospital settings. Uh, Dr. Murthy, as you are all aware, that uh, he is a microbiologist and a virologist who was uh, very instrumental uh, in doing the RT-PCR test right in the beginning and he took charge of most of the patients, most of the tests that are done in the North Coast Andhra Pradesh as well as in the East and West Godavari right in the beginning. He is a very hard worker and he has made a significant difference in the testing capabilities of Andhra Pradesh. So with this uh, introduction, now I invite Dr. Richard Sindrich uh, to deliver his talk and at the end be available for answering the questions. Most of the questions will come in the chat box and we will be uh, moderating that and we'll be asking the questions at the end. Please be available for that. Over to you, Dr. Richard Sindrich. Please share your screen. Uh, good morning. I hope I can be heard. Um, uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'd like to give a brief overview of mucormycosis. It's a very broad topic and one that uh, we don't have very much information on. It's a continually evolving field. Mucormycosis, thankfully, is a relatively rare infectious disease. Um, mucor is uh, mitigated by fungi of the order mucoralis. Uh, those would include rhizopus, mucor, lecthemia, rhizomucor, rizo cunninghamella, apophysomyces, and saccasania. These are molds, um, and these are the more common pathogens. Mucormycosis is a life-threatening, often fatal, rapidly progressive, invasive fungal infection. It is associated with impaired immune status. More commonly, we see it with uncontrolled diabetes. It's also very relatively commonly seen in hematological malignancy uh, and transplant recipients. Those with genetic uh, deficiencies in uh, PMN functions such as CAR9 deficiency, chronic granulomatous disease. It is said to be seen in HIV, though in over 20 years in specialty of HIV, I've never seen a case of mucormycosis in an HIV patient. But neutropenia and malnutrition also contribute to the patient population. Um, <clears throat> with immunocompetent Hosts, it can be seen with direct inoculation into disrupted skin and mucosa, usually with vascular compromise. And then epidemics and outbreaks have been reported. Uh, there was quite a bit of literature on mucormycosis with the Joplin tornadoes here in the United States. Uh, there were also outbreaks in Haiti with the uh, earthquake there, and also in India with the Indian Ocean to tsunami a few years back. It's been associated with contaminated healthcare products as well, nosocomial, and with IV drug abuse. 
sorry. The pathogenesis. Um, mononuclear and polymorphonuclear phagocytes generate of oxidative metabolites and cat cationic peptide defenses. These same cells are the major defense against molds. Um, so in the host, there's some sort of phagocyte dysfunction. Hyperglycemia will impede the function of polymorphonuclear site. Acidosis also disrupts the function of these cells. Corticosteroid suppression uh, is also um, used to suppress the function of uh, mononuclear and polynuclear, polymorphonuclear phagocytes. Um, in chemotherapy for leukemia, lymphoma, other uh, malignant states, uh, phagocytes are depleted. Uh, and it is seen with malnutrition. Uh, <clears throat> interesting, iron uptake is linearly correlated with the growth of rhizopus species and is believed to also uh, correlate with growth of other mucor uh, molds. Deferoxamine serves as a cytopore for, for rhizopus. So use of deferoxamine in iron overload is a risk factor for development of mucormycosis. And also, interestingly enough, acidosis increases free iron and uh, creates an environment that is uh, conducive for growth of, of the mucor uh, molds. Um, the molds um, interact with the, uh, the host. Um, the hallmark of the infection is the uniform presence of angio invasion with vessel thrombosis and tissue necrosis. Tissue necrosis decreases pH and increases free iron. It sort of propagates an environment where the mold can, can grow freely. Rhizopus spores have the ability to, to adhere to subendothelial matrix proteins. Um, so they're there, ready to sprout into the endothelial cells. Germinated spores of rhizopus damage endothelial cells in vitro, which is mediated through phagocytosis of the mold and does not require a viable fungus. This is really very interesting because the, the last point here is the implication is that by killing the mold, once the presence is firmly established, you might not be preventing subsequent tissue injury. Um, and the mechanism of cellular damage really hasn't been worked out fully. We don't understand that. So the clinical manifestations of mucor, usually it's a rapid progressive angioinvasive uh, infection with extensive tissue necrosis and local extension. The rate of progression also is variable due to uh, from rapidly fatal within a few days or even a few hours uh, to a smoldering progression to death over several months. Um, the various manifestations, cutaneous and soft tissue, tissue infections often due to trauma with immunocompromise can spread very rapidly. Usually with um, trauma, there is going to be vascular compromise. Rhino orbital cerebral is, is seen in uncontrolled diabetes and as I said, it's a very rare disease, but this is usually what we see in the community hospitals here in the United States, people coming in with uncontrolled diabetes and they have um, pain within their sinuses, um, very intense pain. Leads to cavernous sinus thrombosis, orbital apex syndrome, uh, dysfunction of the extraocular uh, muscles. Uh, it is also seen gastrointestinal, usually leads to rapid perforation and dissemination to the intra-abdominal organs, intestines. Uh, it's more common in premature neonates. Um, renal involvement is usually secondary to hematoma spread. Um, as I've mentioned already, trauma can seed the bones and joints it's count and is compounded by vascular compromise. Uh, in solid organ and uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplants, pulmonary uh, involvement is usually what is seen. 
Um, so diagnostics, somebody is coming in with coughing up blood or intense nose pain, or sinus pain, facial pain, or abdominal pain or something. Um, imaging is the first step we usually take. Um, it is used to localize and define the presenting complaint. It may show arterial occlusion, venous obstruction, or actual tissue invasion. It serves as a, uh, a localization to do biopsy and find out, find tissue to make the diagnosis. There are antigen markers are still not really available. In some uh, oncology centers, uh, bone marrow transplant and uh, uh, in such a setting, galactomannan might be used to exclude aspergillus. But this is really nonspecific and you might have a mixed infection. So galactomannan, the presence may be misleading. You might still have mucor, although it, there's a marker for aspergillus. And beta D -gluc glucan is not a test that has any merit in evaluating for mucor. The microscopy is really the most important step. It provides a rapid presumptive diagnosis. It cannot identify to genus or species. You really need to have sporulation to do that. You need a culture. Um, Commonly, uh, mucor is non-septate or quasi-septate, irregular ribbon-like hyphae. There's a wide angle of non-dichotomous branching greater than 45 to 90 degrees and greater hyphal diameters compared to other filamentous fungi. Um, the microbiology is difficult. Culture allows speciation and antifungal susceptibility, but you don't always grow the mucor. And so you're making a presumptive diagnosis with the, um, with the pathology, the actual slides. Um, the, the growing, the uh, cultivation of the fungus is really an art. Um, grinding will destroy the mold and uh, will kill the, kill the culture. And you have to slice and be aware of what you're doing when you're plating. The, the molds for growth. Different strains might have different temperature preferences and you don't know what strain you're dealing with when you're starting off with a culture. Um, it's very unusual to be able to even give a genus with a um, with just the micro microscopy. Um, and there also might be specific media which may be required. Um, certain uh, molds will require a certain media and you don't know which mold you're dealing with. So it becomes a complex issue of how many different plates and what temperatures you're going to incubate them at. So that myco mycological expertise is often essential. Um, the molecular-based methods for detection of mucor DNA in fresh and fixed tissue samples is available, but it's extremely limited and usually only in academic centers. Susceptibility testing, the European Committee on Antimicrobial Susceptibility Testing and the Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute in the United States have standardized methodologies for antifungal susceptibility for, for mucor. And they both recommend 24 hour incubation and the two methods uh, correlate very well. Um, epidemiological cutoff values have been established for many species, but those don't necessarily have clinical correlation. You can't say that because this MIC is this, that this is a susceptible fungus or um, that it is resistant. Um, it is for comparing different strains in different settings and uh, the clinical correlation is just that. What clinical results you derive from treating a patient with an antifungal. In vetro M MIC show amphotericin B to be the most effective agent against most species of mucorales. So the therapeutic options and consideration, uh, considerations here. Mucormycosis is often rapidly progressive. It's an emergency. When you're thinking mucor, you have to move very, very quickly because it is a rapidly progressive infection. First thing to do is to correct the metabolic 
metabolic abnormalities and immune deficits um, as quickly as possible. Control the diabetes, uh, colony stimulation factors to bring up the neutrophils, do what you can to restore a normal physiology in the patient. Eucaryotes fungi may have a wide range of susceptibility to chemotherapy, which must begin before speciation or susceptibility is known. So you're really going on past experience with this disease rather than knowing, well, this is, uh, this is such and such a mold and is going to be sensitive to this. Um, you don't know that. Um, you have to act very quickly. Angioinvasion, thrombosis, and tissue necrosis effectively prevent penetration of anti-infective agents. Um, you cut off the circulation, the, uh, the antifungal can't arrive at the destination. In vitro susceptibilities do not necessarily correlate with in vivo clinical results and tissue damage and necrosis may not be prevented by the killing of the organisms with fungicidal agents, um, which is a really very important factor to keep in mind. Randomized controlled trials of mycosis are difficult to design and enroll. It's a very rare disease. Patients present with different, uh, different degree burden of uh, mold infection. Uh, it's, it's just really very difficult to coordinate. Most of the studies done with mucor are done through case studies. Surgical debridement with antifungal chemotherapy has been shown to be the best chance of clinical success. And surgical debridement should be done first. So the surgical options and suspected and confirmed mucormycosis, debridement to clean margins is the first step. Excision as possible, uh, limits spread, provides histopathology and material for culture. Um, it is a, an important thing to do, consider and act as early as possible. Rhinocerebral early excision of infected sinuses and retroorbital spaces. Um, these are some case series. As I said, the randomized trials are, are really not possible in this sort of infection. 49 patients mortality, 70 versus 14% antifungal alone versus early surgical intervention. Series of 17, 65% mortality with chemotherapy alone versus zero with surgery and chemotherapy. There is some selection bias in these results. And as I say, they're a review of, of cases, but surgery is an is essential uh, part of the therapy of mucor. Pulmonary prevention of bleeding and, and also limitation of spread, uh, case series of 255, 68% mortality medical versus 11% with surgical intervention. Um, hepatic abscess, drainage, and resection of affected tissues, prolonged survival, this has been shown. Osteoarticular infection, a case series of 34, 85% of the infected undergo debridement, fixation, or grafting with chemotherapy. There's a 76 response rate with 18% attributable to death. Looking at this whole the study, the case with this, it's, it's really difficult to put that together because these uh, osteoarticular infections were wrought by different risk factors. Some of them were transplant, um, bone marrow transplant, solid organ. Some were trauma. Um, putting it all together um, and coming out with an 18% attributable death is really very difficult to do. Um, but even in, in bone infection, the surgical uh, component is really very essential. So move it, moving to um, therapy, chemotherapy, um, this is amphotericin B. You have a depiction of the molecule here. It's a um, macrolide. And this is a budding yeast. Um, here you have the ergosterol to which the amphotericin binds. There is a uh, sex septet, sextet, of uh, amphotericin particles that form a pore in the, the surface of the fungal membrane that allows the disruption of electrolytes and destroys the cell. But there's more to it is, is that because amphotericin is also internalized into the, uh, into the fungus and disrupts the uh, 
the machinations of the uh, metabolism of the cell increases oxygen free radicals, uh, damages mitochondrial uh, proteins. Uh, it's not simply the disruption of the, uh, the, uh, the ion in environment of the uh, intracellular component. Um, it's also, it wreaks habit with the internal metabolism of the cell as well. Um, so amphotericin creation to elimination, it's the most important uh, antifungal that we have in treating mucormycosis and the one that we have the most experience with. It's a natural product. It's a macrolide polyene produced through fermentation by an actinomyces, streptomyces nodosus. It's insoluble in saline. It's formulated as a mixture with detergent, sodium deoxycoate, forming ribbon-like aggregates and a mixed colloidal dispension. Now, upon infusion, this dissociates from the detergent and binds 90 to 99% to plasma lipoproteins, HDL and LDL. So there becomes a triphasic plasma profile, the initial plasma half-life of 24 to 48 hours, only five to two to five percent is excreted unchanged in urine and less in the feces. Um, then there's an elimination half-life of 15 days with accumulation in the liver, spleen, and lesser in lungs and kidney acids uptake um, by macular uh, macro by cells of the, um, the immune system. There's terminal elimination accounts for 80% of concentration under the area under the curve with 30, 33% in the urine and 42.5% in, in the feces is unchanged drug. Amphotericin is not metabolized to any appreciable extent within, within us. With time, you could recover 100% of the drug if you're monitoring fecal output and, and, uh, and urine. Um, the different formulations will give you that recovery over different time lapses. Um, it was always a big question. What the question asked on rounds when I was a resident, what happens to amphotericin when it's injected? Nobody knew because it was just slowly eliminated and um, it was never metabolized. And it, and it took some time to realize that uh, amphotericin is a pretty stable compound. It has substantial toxicities. As a microbial agent is recognized by toll-like receptors and transmembrane signaling proteins on mononuclear cells. It induces expression of pro-inflammatory cytokine genes, multiple interleukins, and tumor necrosis factor. You get fever, chills, nausea. There are infusion reactions. This is a microbial product. It is a a substance to which <clears throat> your body is going to react. There is immediate vasoconstriction of the afferent renal arterioles through second, the secondary to relatively high exposure of renal cells to the drug. Um, amphotericin has a tenfold greater affinity for binding to fungal, ergosterol, than to mammalian cellular cholesterol. Nonetheless, it does bind to cholesterol. It is bound to HDL and LDL in the serum once it is infused, um, that is how it is transported. Renal tubular cells have abundant LDL receptors and endocytize the, the lipid drug complex of increasing the toxicity to the kidney. So you have an immediate vasoconstriction with the kidneys, which raises the creatinine, um, and then it has secondary effects uh, with uh, intoxication of the renal tubular cells, which have a more lasting effect. So it's a very potent uh, effect, particularly on the kidneys, um, but it's uh, also introducing a foreign substance, a, uh, a fungal product in effect into the, into the body. So amphotericin, the theory behind the lipid formulation, <clears throat> the solubility of amphotericin is enhanced by uh, associating it with lipids. So a lipid bilayer encapsulation protects the drug from destruction by enzymatic action. Well, there are no enzymes really that are degrading. We already know that uh, amphotericin is very, very stable, but it does dampen. It hides the, the molecule from, from 
activating the immune system and getting the chills, fever, and other associated uh, infusion reactions. Liposomes alter the pharmacokinetics by slowing the release of the active drug. Um, and the association with lipid carriers facilitates uptake of the complex by the circulating monocytes, as well as other cells of the mononuclear phagocyte system. So your delivery is targeted to sites of infection. Those same mononuclear phagocytes are going to the site of infection. And the composition of lipids can, can affect transfer of the drug HDL rather than to LDL. Um, it's really very interesting, but by um, manipulating the charges on the lipid composition, you can select to which moiety within the uh, serum HDL or LDL that the uh, amphotericin is transferred to. And then you remember that LDL is taken up in the uh, renal tubular cells, so that transferring the, preferably to HDL will prevent uh, renal tubular damage. And it's a really very useful pharmacokinetic parameter to work with. So liposomal amphotericin B is really the best formulation of amphotericin. It's a small unilamular vesicle formulation supplied by as a lophilized powder. The lipid con consists of hydrogenated soy, phosphatidylcholine, choline, diester oil, phosphatidylglycerin, DSPG, in a 2 to 1 to 0.8 to 1 ratio. Um, and the binding, the binding is wrought through pair charging of the amino group of the drug and the phosphate group of the DSPG. All right, the multimeric barrel pore arrangement of the amphotericin and fungal membranes is thought to be replicated within the actual liposome. So you have that barrel of uh, uh, disruption to the fungal membrane uh, being transported to the fungal membrane in the liposome. Because of its small size and negative particle, uh, negative charge, the vesicles avoid substantial recognition. And uptake by the mononuclear phagocytic system doesn't happen as readily as with other formulation. A single dose results in a much higher C-max than amphotericin, uh, the straight drug bound by detergent. In animal models, it's also really very important to, to note that liposomal amphotericin B showed higher CNS concentrations compared to uh, the liposomal complex and the regular salt, thus making it, it is the preferred agent for CNS fungal infections. It's the other formulation, there are actually three, the, the, the basic detergent-bound amphotericin, the liposome, and the lipid complex. Amphotericin B complex with two lipids. I have them here, dimisostol phosphatidylcholine, DMPC, and L-alpha dimeristol phosphatidylglycerin, DMGB. This formulation distributes into HDL and decreases toxicity uh, to renal tubules. Um, it's, a, it's a very large compound, which is readily recognized by macrophages, which is good and bad because it is taken up fairly readily and goes to the liver and spleen. From there, it is um, transferred over time, prolonging the half-life, and uh, goes to tissue with the, um, the macrophages. I've um, I've included this slide um, because I understand that there are shortages of amphotericin with more use and that the liposomal format, which is really the preferred drug form, is um, in, can be in short supply in certain areas. Um, I remember when I was a fellow, um, we had a, an epidemic of coccidioides meningitis. Um, this was in Los Angeles after the Northridge earthquake, and there was quite a bit of dust and inhalation of coccidioides. And the ICUs were filled with people with coccidioides meningitis. This was before the formulation of liposomal amphotericin lipid. So what we were doing, were injecting amphotericin B into fat emulsion that's used in TPN. And I dug up this study from 1992 um, comparing amphotericin uh, 
to um, amphotericin and salt uh, dis diffused into fat emulsion versus a, a glucose solution. And basically, it, it shows it's a very small study, um, only 22 patients. Um, but it, it decreased the uh, acute reaction to the infusion. Uh, the side effects was con considerably decreased using the fat emulsion. Um, by its use, I can testify that it was as effective clinically, um, but it did decrease. And uh, fat emulsions are more readily uh, available uh, when you run, you run out of the liposomal format or the lipid suspension. But this can be used uh, with very good results. Isovuconazole is another uh, novel triazol with a broad spectrum of activity against molds and yeast. In a limited study of 21 treated with isobuconazole compared efficacy to 33 matched patients using a fungal registry enabled licensure in the US for mucormycosis. As I said, these uh, randomized controlled trials are extreme. They're just very difficult to design and enact. And you're not going to, to, to develop a very good study uh, waiting for the rare occurrence of, uh, of mucor. The study could be faulted by different formulations of amphotericin in the comparison. They were using both the, the salt, uh, different lipid formulations. It demonstrated as effective as amphotericin to feed for decrease in fungal burden and survival in neutrophic mouse model. Uh, most guidelines now recommend frontline therapy only in the face of pre-existing renal compromise. Um, one good, another additional good thing about it is available as intravenous and oral formulations so that a patient who's doing well can be switched to the oral form for long-term suppression. Posiconazole is the only other drug at the present time commercially available that is being used for mucormycosis. It is well as an azole, it has activity against moles. It's available in oral and intravenous forms, so the latter use cyclodextrin to solubilize, and this can be a nephrotoxin. Um, it has erratic uh, absorption and drug levels with the oral suspension. This led to a de delayed release oral formulation that has better consistency. Of the amphotericin isobuconazole, it's the one uh, antifungal that is recommended that drug levels be kept monitored uh, because they can still be erratic. And efficacy in, in studies uh, in use in mucor is, is extremely limited. Um, most are in retrospective design. Um, there is a wide variety of infectious sites and lack of drug monitoring. Um, you use posiconazole when you have to. It's available. It's not the best agent. So. I've run through a number of things, but I'd like to summarize. Um, mucormycosis is a medical and surgical emergency. As soon as it's recognized or thought of, it has to be acted upon. Mucor mucorellus molds create ideal growth environments through angioinvasion and infarction. The angioinvasion and infarction creates an acidosis. The acidosis releases iron. That is a growth uh, factor for the mold. It uh, it thrives in, in, in an environment that it creates. And it, it, it invades very rapidly and it's, a, it's an extremely dangerous condition that you want to get a handle on as quickly as possible. Therapeutic actions are required often before the fungus is identified. Before, it, yes, you need to do a biopsy, you need to do the, the pathology, you get the mold and you act you, you need to get a team together, you need to get a surgeon, you need to get antifungals on, on board. The preferred tested and tried uh, antifungals are amphotericin in different formulations. If you have CNS involvement, liposomal amphotericin is essential. Um, for other than CNS infections, the lipid formulation or even fat emulsion lip uh, formulation uh, in-house can be used with uh, 
for the most part, good results. The other thing is that the patient is going to, to die before you have antifungal sensitivities on the isolate available. Um, so all this talk about uh, culturing and getting sensitivities, it's really for um, statistics and the uh, knowledge base that that is being done. Uh, sometimes it'll, it'll work for you, but um, as I said, you have to move very, very quickly before you have all the information. Often serial debridement is necessary. You have to take the patient back to the OR repeatedly um, to get everything. As I said, you need to remember that dead mold isn't necessarily harmless. It can still cause damage even though it has been killed. Correct the underlying process such as, as can best be done. Get them out of DKA, it's a, a no-brainer. Um, put on the colony stimulation factors, um, optimize nutrition um, as best can be done in uh, a really very sick patient. Amphotericin B formulations are the preferred antifungals with liposomal formulation indicator for CNS involvement. Isobuconazole has actually good CNS um, penetration. One thing that has to be said about isobuconazole is that it, there were trials of isobuconazole in prevention of fungal infection in bone marrow and hematopoietic stem cell transplant. And it's interesting that there was some breakthrough and that breakthrough was with mucor. So yes, it can be effective against mucor, but mucor is a very, uh, broad term that encompasses many fungi and many different strains, species of the same genus. Uh, the antimicrobial um, sensitivity pattern is different. The most tried and true is amphotericin. It's the preferred agent. And that clinical experience with isobuconazole still needs more, uh, a, a better knowledge base. The length of therapy is determined by the clinical course. If you survive, that's great. Um, if you get all the fungus out, that's a very good prognosis, but um, it might take many months to restore the patient to a, a normal physiological state with the immune system and sometimes lengthy treatment with antifungal therapy will be necessary and that can be done possibly with uh, oral formulations of prosiconazole or isobuconazole. And that's what I have. Um, thank you for inviting me. I'm very honored to have been asked. Video? Okay. Video. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sindrich. You can unshare your screen. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, uh, elaborate presentation on this overview on the mucomycosis. And I could see a few questions in the chat box. And uh, primarily it says that now in India, this problem has reached the epidemic proportions. Though we have been using the steroids for various ailments in earlier, it wasn't seen. So what could be the reason for this sudden upsurge reaching the epidemic proportion now in India? Uh, primarily, it has been attributed to the uncontrolled diabetes as a result of uh, using steroids, particularly for prolonged periods of time, and which has been common even earlier in some of the ailments when we use the steroids, and but mucormycosis is not seen to that extent. What is your take on this? Why do you think that this has become so prevalent now in India? Um, I'm not familiar with the types of mucor that are being seen in India right now, but for the concentrations of steroid that are being used in the treatment of COVID, it doesn't make sense that there should be a surge of uh, mucor associated with it. Um, we're talking about low level immune suppression with steroids. Uh, um, so I'm wondering if there's possibly contamination. Um, 
some of the steroid preparations that are being used may well have been contaminated. There is a, a greater demand. Um, so I, I'm not really sure that I can answer the question because I'm not really familiar. I'm not seeing the type of patients or the, the locations of the mucor as they come in. But I would suspect that some of it could be nosocomial with uh, contaminated products being given in hospitals. There is certainly a component of immune suppression, but given, as I said before, the low level of immune suppression that's wrought by the steroids in COVID, I tend to doubt that it's just immune suppression. Um, there might be an element also of malnutrition and multifactorial, um, but a, a more thorough investigation has to be done. Yeah, uh, Dr. Sindrich, uh, I wish to bring to your notice that these are all, uh, uh, all these cases are not coming from a single hospital or a single city. They are spread over all of the Andhra Pradesh, I mean the state of Andhra Pradesh which has got some 50 million population. Uh, basically, that indicates that all these cases have started almost at a time. There must be a common factor rather than only the uh, the uh, nosocomial uh, sort of an infection that we are thinking of. And uh, the other aspect I wish to ask you is, how do we time the surgery? Like when somebody presents with a swelling over the infraorbital region, uh, running some temperature and gets admitted, uh, how long after starting the uh, the amphotericin B, should one go for surgery and are there any specific indications when the surgery has to be undertaken at this particular time? Well, surgery should be undertaken as soon as you have a diagnosis. If you have a biopsy that shows mucor with angio invasion, um, you, you go to surgery. Um, you, as, as I said, this is a rapidly progressive uh, infection and you can, you, it can be life-saving to, to to debreed as soon as possible. Um, so if you're waiting, thinking that the, the antifungal is going to kick in, that's not the way to be thinking. It's, this is a surgical as well as surgical emergency. And the sooner you get the debridement, the fungus out, the better the prognosis for the patient. So uh, do you have the chat box there? You can take the other questions. Uh, yeah. I, I'm having trouble getting um, back to the big screen. Yeah, yeah. Just, you were you were screen sharing. Stop share. Okay, here I am. I'm sorry. Great. They don't use them very much. All right. So here's the chat box and thank you. Okay. Shall we call it iatrogenic or nosocomial? Has it become epidemic due to steroid usage? Well, we we're still looking at that. I, I, I don't have all the cases. And um, to me, it doesn't make sense. Um, I don't think it's iatrogenic. It, 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 it might be. And um, so it has to be looked at more thoroughly. I'm not just going to say, well, no, it doesn't make sense. This is a long box. Steroids for a few weeks are frequently used in many clinical conditions previously, but mucomycosis is not frequently seen as now. So what would the other factors which result in this epidemic? Well, well then again, we're also looking at, at nosocomial. Uh, how many of these people that are coming in with mucor receive steroids? I mean, this, this is a, an epidemiological uh, investigation that needs to be, be done. It hasn't been done. And I'm sure that it will be. I think we'll have better information as time goes on and all these cases are reviewed and looked at. Repeated use on mass mass may be contributing. Um, you have to have a degree of immunocompromise for a contaminated mass to be any make any difference. Um, mucor spores are ubiquitous. It's just that we handle them very well with our normal immune system. So I, it's you know, it's nice to change mass, but I don't think it's contributing to the mucor epidemic. What is the harm in combining epitericin and nasals? Well, that's been looked at, and um, there really isn't too much of a harm to it, but um, it doesn't really clearly show a benefit either. Um, so, uh, 
you're dealing with possible mixed toxicities. Um, isobuconazole is fairly safe. Amphotericin is, is proven to be effective. Um, people are, are continuing to look at that right now. Um, I think more people are interested in finding out what they can get with the individual agents, the azole separately. Um, there are some uh, people saying that there are benefits to using both together. As liposomal amphotericin is not taken up by macrophages and they are cells to respond. Well, to a certain extent, liposomal amphotericin is taken up uh, by some the phagocytes, but um, that's a good question. Um, I don't think so, because I, I think that some phagocytes are taking it up. Um, they also have a sustained level of the, uh, the liposome within the, the plasma, and there's a preferential uh, for the fungal membrane um, that works out that way. Um, that's a question that I didn't anticipate, and I really don't have a good a good answer for. I, I think that the liposomal clinically has proven itself to be very effective, um, and that that's not a factor. Is the only reason for preferring liposomal? Well, the small size, um, the well, it's certainly a factor that uh, the decreased infusion rate, but it also the small size enables CNS uh, penetration and more readily penetrates into the site of infection as well. So that is a very big plus for the liposomal formulation. Um, what is the first sign of this early infection is pain. Um, Usually somebody comes in, uh, that is almost always, or hemoptysis in, in pulmonary involvement um, with all the... Uh, so the questions are predominantly about the prophylaxis. Can um, these drugs can be used as a prophylaxis in these COVID-19 patients so that they will not develop the fungal infections? Is the, uh, There are a couple of questions in that direction. Well, the, I think the answer would be, do we really see that much of it that we would think that prophylaxis is necessary? Um, I think the overwhelming majority of people aren't developing this, and it's a, it's a considerable uh, expense. Uh, you're going to use oral formulations of antifungal. The only antifungals effective against uh, mucor are is isobuconazole and posiconazole. Um, and, and what you're going to do is select for resistant fungus. Um, I don't think that's a very good idea. Um, certainly in the setting of bone marrow transplant and uh, extended neutropenia, you're going to be using prophylaxis. But as I said, with isobuconazole, um, the breakthrough was mucor, um, which is not good. Um, so no, I wouldn't advocate for uh, prophylactic use in the setting of COVID uh, with steroids. There's mucormycosis that we are not have the potential to turn up into an epidemic. Well, I mean, it already is an epidemic from my understanding of what is going on in India. Um, if you have three cases in the Bronx, that's a major epidemic. Um, it's a very rare uh, infection. Yes. Um, so you're having an epidemic of mucor right now, my understanding. Fuconazole is worthless for mucor. So Dr. Sindrich, I'll read this chat box for you. Is there any role of pre and probiotic usage in preventing these opportunistic infections in fungal, opportunistic infections uh, by this fungus? That's a question. Not that I know of. Yeah. I, I wouldn't think so because we acquire um, mucor through inhalation. The spores are present in the air. Our normal immune systems usually take care of it. A probiotic really, I, I think of as a GI factor and uh, the main route of infection is respiratory. So I don't think that it would be uh, a good, yeah. it would work well. Then uh, another question is as to what to do if uh, people have the toxicity for the amphotericin B or if they have the acute kidney injury or the chronic kidney disease. 
Uh, what should be the alternative uh, choice? Isobuconazole and posiconazole. Isobuconazole, that is um, where most guidelines, the European guidelines, uh, specifically state that if you have existing renal compromise, to go to isobuconazole first, because you will have renal uh, acute renal injury with use of amphotericin. Yeah, there's one more question that whether nitric oxide is of any uh, use in, as an antifungal. I, I don't have any experience in nitrous oxide and use of an antifungal, and I didn't see in my review of the literature it being used uh, as an antifungal in the setting of mucor. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Sindrich, for your uh, wonderful presentation as well as uh, answering all the questions in the chat box and. Uh, empowering all of doctors with the knowledge. Uh, thank you so much and so nice of you for giving your valuable time. Well, thank you for asking me. I'm, I'm very honored and uh, have a pleasant evening. The day is starting here. Yeah, yeah. We'll go to the second speaker. Uh, Dr. B. Devi Madhavi will be dealing with uh, the prevention of mucormycosis, the preventive aspect of it, the head of community medicine at Andhra Medical College. Uh, you can share your screen, Dr. Madhavi. Good evening, all. Am I audible? Uh, yes, you are. Yes, you are, Madhavi. Uh, be a little loud. Good evening, sir. Uh, good evening to the respected dignitaries in Andhra Pradesh. At the outset, I'd like to thank AP Kovinar Committee for giving me this opportunity to present my views on prevention of mycormycosis. And good evening to all the doctors who are attending this Kovinar. So I'd uh, start my presentation with, again, though it is repetitive, with what is mucormycosis, a little about the agent factors and a little about the host factors, and then we'll continue with the preventive measures. So as we have said, mucormycosis is a general term for a group of uncommon infections caused by fungus. Can you and can you the microphone a little closer so that you can you are more better audible? Yes, sir. Is this better? Yeah. So the myco mucormycosis is caused by a group of related molds from the order mucoralis. It is an opportunistic infection and the most common type that is seen in India and throughout the world is the ROC type, that is the rhino orbito cerebral form. And why we are concerned about it? It is a rapidly progressive disease and delay in diagnosis and management leads to a high mortality of as high as 50% and if it is a disseminated disease, the mortality uh, ranges to as high as 80%. So coming to the problem statement, so before COVID also, we should know that mycormycosis has been on the rise globally. The global estimate is that there are around 0.02 cases per 1 lakh population and compared to this, in India, it is estimated in currently we do not have any population based studies. So the computational model based methods have put the estimate of prevalence in India to be 14 cases. That is nearly 70 times the global burden is seen in India. 
And if you see across the years, a study by Chakravarti et al. has reported that the number of cases, the case series we have seen, the number of cases have been on the rise and in a shorter span of one year, 75 cases have been reported in a 18 months time. And what is disturbing to see is the cumulative burden for the disease is ranging in the amounts of lakhs and the mean attributable mortality is around 65,000 deaths per year. Now, our interest in mucormycosis is again because of the increased number of cases that we are seeing in the post-COVID patients. As per the electronic media, which has been updated up to 19th May, Rajasthan has reported more than 100 cases and mucormycosis has been declared as an epidemic there. The Public Health Minister of Maharashtra has said that more than 90 deaths from mucormycosis have occurred in the state. Haryana has reported 115 cases, Andhra Pradesh has reported 9 cases, and cases are also reported from Telangana, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, and Karnataka. These are mostly from the electronic media that these statistics are there, but as we healthcare providers are aware that there are more and more cases being reported, however, they have not been officially confirmed. Coming to the agent, as we have said, order mucaralis, it belongs to the family mucaraceae. We have more than 27 species causing the uh, mucormycosis. The most common being the rhizopus and in within that, the rhizus is the most common form. Again, another form which we see commonly in India is Epophysomyces elegans and Saxenia, etc. are also seen in India. Always, we, if you can recall your community medicine classes or your SPM classes, we always talk about the diseases occurring because of the disturbance in the agent, host and environment. So after the agent, we come to the host factors. The host factors which make it a person predisposed to developing mycosis. Madhavi, can you be a little loud? Your voice is going down and down. Am I audible now? Yeah, much better. Yes, sir. So the predisposing factors for mycormycosis includes uncontrolled diabetes mellitus, immunosuppression by steroid use, treatment with immunomodulators, comorbidities including malignancies, voriconazole therapy where it, ex uh, where it comes out as a breakthrough infection, prolonged use of higher antibiotics, chronic kidney disease and chronic liver disease have also been identified as host factors in some studies from India. And maybe to answer what Dr. Buchiraju has put in the chat, why are we seeing more cases now? Though we have been seeing steroid use earlier, I would say that added angio invasion and endothelial damage due to the thrombotic microangiopathy in COVID-19 also may be what is making our people more susceptible. Another factor I would also think is that this may be uh, like you would say, a uh, collaborating factor that now that we have the COVID occupying all the healthcare resources, the diabetes mellitus, patients with diabetes mellitus and other chronic diseases are not seeking medical care for control of their conditions. So that may also contribute to making them more predisposed to these diseases. So, as we have said earlier, so the environmental factors associated with mycormycosis are that as it is said, it is found in the environment. They are saprophytes and they are found mostly in the soil, but also found in the air. So they're ubiquitous. And in our country, that is the tropical and subtropical humid climate with high temperatures, make it a very conducive environment for the growth of these mucors. And transmission is predominantly through inhalation. That's why we see the rhino orbito cerebral form most common. And also we have reported the pulmonary forms are also reported in general. But other forms can also occur like inoculation. When it occurs through inoculation, we may have the cutaneous forms or ingestion of the spores may lead to gastrointestinal form. Now coming to the onset of outbreaks. So outbreaks were earlier associated both in the community as well as with healthcare outbreaks. And this was 
The community onset outbreaks were usually associated with trauma sustained during natural disasters, whereas the healthcare associated outbreaks are usually linked to adhesive bandages, wooden tongue depressors, hospital linen, negative pressure rooms, water leaks, poor air filtration, non-sterile medical devices, and building constructions. So now coming to the COVID-19 situation and why this may be more predisposed. This is because COVID-19 has made our persons more susceptible because of the prolonged ICU stay, long-standing oxygen therapy of more than one week, long-term Riles tube feeding, humidifier bottle contamination or contaminated limit. Reports in India also indicate that patients who are in home isolation have also presented with mucormycosis, which, ex which is currently not explainable. So these are some of the pictures of the clinical presentation of uh, the common ROC form, where we see the HR in different parts of the face. So the ICMR that is and the National Task Force on COVID has come out with an advisory and it includes the signs, symptoms and what predisposes. The signs and symptoms include pain and redness around the eye and nose, fever, headache, coughing, shortness of breath, bloody vomit and altered mental status. The predisposing factors as we have said earlier, it is uncontrolled diabetes mellitus, immunosuppression by steroids, prolonged ICU stay, comorbidities, and so on. How to prevent? So the general prevention is use masks if visiting dusty areas, wear shoes, long trousers, long sleeves, and gloves while gardening, maintain personal hygiene, including scrub baths, and when to suspect mucormycosis. So sinusitis, one-sided facial pain, blackish discoloration, discoloration over bridge of nose, toothache, loosening of tooth, blurred or double vision with pain or fever, chest pain or pleural effusion. So the advice for the physicians is do's, the do's and the don'ts. Control, ensure that the patients have hyper control of the blood sugars, monitoring of blood sugars in the post-COVID patients, use of steroids judiciously, Use clean sterile waters for humidifiers, using antifungals and antibiotics judiciously, and not to miss the warning signs, not to include, not to consider that all blocked nose cases to be only of bacterial sinusitis. We should not hesitate to seek aggressive investigations now. So the advisory of ICMR continues to manage. In management, they say control diabetes and diabetic ketoacidosis. Reduce steroids with aim to discontinue rapidly. Discontinue immunomodulatory drugs. No antifungal prophylaxis as per the national advisory. Extensive surgical debridement to remove all necrotic material. Maintaining adequate systemic hydration. Infuse normal saline IV before amphotericin B infusion. Antifungal ther therapy for at least four to six weeks and monitoring of patients clinically and with radio Im imaging for response and to detect disease progression. So the ICMR has also said that a team approach works best and we would need to have a microbiologist, an intensivist, a neurologist, an ENT specialist, an ophthalmologist, a dental surgeon and a biochemist in the team for managing the mucormycosis. Further details can be obtained from the website. And these have been formed by the National Task Force for COVID-19. So coming to the, as has been told my previous speaker too, there is very little that is known about this. So the first step in prevention would include primary prevention, that is creating awareness among the public. And we should have a good communication plan for that. And media and professional bodies should take up this task of creating appropriate awareness among the public. So some of the key points that need to be again emphasized is it is an opportunistic infection, it is non-contagious and people should know about the signs and sim symptoms when to suspect uh, mucormucosis and seek early health care. 
So these are the components which should be told to the public. And as we have said, the most 50% of the cases of mucor prior to COVID-19, the studies from India have shown that diabetes mellitus and diabetic ketoacidosis were responsible for most of the cases. Prevention and control of diabetes mellitus would go a long way in preventing this disease. Chronic kidney disease, tuberculosis and COPD have been identified as risk factors from various studies conducted in India and reported by Prakash et al. So continuing the prevention measures, so capacity building among healthcare providers is very important and the team approach for early diagnosis and management is required. And not only we need to have capacity building, it is also important that the lab capacity for diagnosis is increased, especially to diagnose the newer species of mucor which are being reported. Rigorous infection control practices in hospitals should be done and restrictions on indiscriminate use of steroids should be completed. And the reason why we are not having answers to many of the questions is that we have not much data on the mucor. So we need to develop a robust surveillance mechanism which will be able to answer several of the questions. Coming to the specific measures to be taken in COVID-19 scenario is personal hygiene, maintaining of good oral hygiene, medical management should be judicious use of steroids at right time, right dose and for right period. No steroids if patients are not hypoxic. Avoid prescribing post-discharge steroids. Low dose for 10 days only in hypoxic patients. So apart from the national advisory, we have seen the different states coming up with different advisories and the Maharashtra government has in fact given the exact dosages to be given and for how long it should be given. Apart from this, we have to have strict diabetes control with 110 to 180 milligrams per deciliter with insulin and oral hypoglycemic agents. Also, monitoring of every hospitalized patient at least once a day should be done and proper management of diabetic ketoacidosis should also be done. Continuing the infection control measures, what should be done is use clean sterile water for humidifiers during oxygen therapy. Disinfection of all gadgets in ICU regularly and not to reuse disposable oxygen delivery devices like nasal prongs, face masks, etc. These may seem like simple things to be told. However, what I think needs to be emphasized among us healthcare providers is who is monitoring whether these are being done or not. Every hospital should have fix the responsibilities and develop SOPs to ensure that these are put into action. My next speaker, Dr. Murthy, will be speaking more elaborately on the hospital infection control measures. Now that we are having more cases among the people who are even being managed, COVID patients being managed at home, we should also think of improving the home environment. So the patient is often asked to be isolated for the first 14 days. So the room should be well ventilated, avoid damp objects around the patient. Use of masks should be as per protocol. So I too have the feeling or it is just my perspective that currently the use of masks in India is not as per the protocol. So when we are using a mask, it should be disposable masks should not be repeatedly used. They should be one-time use. Masks should be replaced when they become moist. Cloth masks should be washed, dried and then reused. So these are some of the things which should be informed to the common public. Continuing the advice that needs to be given to the patient and caregiver at the time of discharge of COVID patients is monitoring of blood glucose levels in diabetics and also that every patient should be informed about the early symptoms and signs of mucor that is nasal blockage, blood tinged nasal discharge, 
pain in the eye, swelling of the eye, double vision, hemicranial headache, headache, numbness over the face, toothaches, loosening of tooth, discomfort during chewing and so on. Follow up on day 7 and 3 weeks after discharge may also be taken. If I know that it is a challenging time, if possible, a, an ENT or an ophthalmology checkup before the patient is discharged, especially if they are diabetic or have been on oxygen therapy for more than 7 days or have been on steroid therapy for more than 10 days should be made possible wherever should be done wherever possible coming to the surveillance the government of andhra pradesh health medical and family welfare welfare has given a covid instant order dated 18521 which has said that mucormycosis is a notifiable disease in andhra pradesh and all practitioners both government and in private sector are to notify suspected and confirmed cases of mucormycosis to the district public health authorities. This will help us to develop some robust data and help us to fill the missing links. The hospitals in Andhra Pradesh which have multidisciplinary treatment and to handle these mucor cases are all the teaching hospitals of all the government medical colleges and other hospitals with requisite speciality treatments as notified by the CEO, Dr. Arabhyashri Healthcare Trust. So these are my references and I'd like to thank the organizers once more for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Hello. Sir, am I audible? Uh, yes, yes, Dr. Devi, you're audible. Thank you. So, thank you. yeah, I think uh, Dr. Sudhakar is just quite engaged with uh, uh, something. Uh, in the meantime, there are a few questions. Uh, they had asked in, in the chat box, Dr. Devi, I request you to answer them. So, yes. one is uh, one of the gen one of the doctors are, uh, are asking. So, is, is it it will, is it possible that this uh, mucormycosis is spreading through not wearing proper mask, not cleaning the mask properly, and wearing a dirty uh, mask? Over to you. Uh, <clears throat> honestly saying, sir, I would not be able to say if it is evidence-based medicine, if you ask me. There are not enough studies to say that. But definitely, we know that the predisposing factors would include moisture and contamination, contaminated linen. So it would definitely may be a contributory factor to it. So Dr. Devi, how to clean, how to, if you are, we are using the uh, cloth mask, so how should that be cleaned? Or yes. So if uh, practically, if you were to say, like if you see where in India, where we have most of the uh, people now with the current positivity rate, we have that many people are in home isolation. Uh, the best thing is dip the mask in hot water, hot water. And then because that is a more practical thing or to a bucket of water, which has a disinfectant added like diluted sodium hypochlorite solution, which may not be a practical solution. So we would say dipping it in hot water, leaving it for at least 30 minutes and then sun dry it for uh, uh, at least overnight so that it is completely dry. That would be helpful. Right. Thank you. Dr. Stucker, over to you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madhavi. Uh, some of the questions that are there uh, have already been answered, the ones which are there in the chat box. Now, uh, uh, let us invite Dr. Uh, D.S. Murthy, the Associate Professor of Microbiology, Rangarai Medical College, to talk on the infection control practices in hospital settings. Dr. Murthy, please. Good evening, sir. Uh, sir, thank you very much, sir, for uh, inviting me for this webinar. 
and also giving us such an encouraging uh, um, introduction. Sir, am I permitted to share the screen, sir? It is showing some error messages. Okay. Is it visible, sir? Yes, yes, it is visible. Murthy, it is visible. Sir, sir thank you, sir. Uh, sir, in the next 15-20 uh, minutes, I will be talking about the infection control practices in the hospital settings related to the mucormycosis uh, pertinent to the COVID cases. And uh, please bear with some degree of overlap with the previous speaker, Dr. Devi Madhavi, Madam, because she also covered the uh, preventive aspects. And as we are all discussing, this um, is because of the fungi belonging to the other mucorelis. And uh, one actual uh, question is, can hospital be a source? So normally, uh, because these infections may be observed during the course of COVID or when the patient is discharged uh, after COVID, um, having uh, treated COVID. So can hospital be a source? Because the patient throughout the environment, these spores are present and particularly in the soil and also in the association with the organic matter that is decaying matter and more common in soil than in air and more common in summer that is warm humid climates it is more common maybe uh, this could be one of the contributing factors why you are seeing more cases nowadays these spores uh, grow well in these climates and people inhale these spores every day and everywhere that means everywhere that means we cannot completely avoid these spores whatever the things you do and probably impossible to completely avoid the contact with any of these fungi so why hospital environment is important for us now? Because we are dealing with the compromised patient in the hospital and the patient may stay for long term in the hospital and the patient moves between the different wards and different units for treatment or for investigations or whatever. And use of steroids and immunosuppressive drugs happens simultaneously along with the diabetes and ketoacidosis. Uh, maybe uh, intrinsically he may be having diabetic or because of the steroid induced. All these factors contribute and the spores or the seeds are everywhere and the patient provides a fertile land. And transmission, as the previous speakers mentioned, will be by inhalation, inoculation, ingestion of the spores from the environment. And uh, maybe sporadic cases may be seen, but some outbreaks related to healthcare may be noted uh, with the use of certain things like adhesive bandages, wooden tongue depressors, hospital linen, negative pressure rooms, water leaks, poor air filtration, non-sterile medical devices and building uh, construction activities. What I do is in the next uh, um, part of my presentation, I will try to cover um, uh, one of these uh, areas where we can uh, do some preventive aspects inside the hospitals. And the next part of my presentation basically deals with the surveillance of the fungal spores in the hospitals. Now it is actually a challenge to investigate because the patients with complicated medical history will be present along with the COVID and many different exposures, as I mentioned already, between the different rooms, different units, different investigating areas, and incubation period is not well established. It is difficult to establish a time period to identify the relevant exposure, whether the patient got exposed after getting into the hospital or he got exposed elsewhere and then admitted to the hospital. And there are multifactorial risk factors. So this makes it challenging to investigate. Also, uh, one problem with the mucor or any uh, fungi like this is, uh, because they are all uh, present in the environment as uh, um, saprophytes, yeah, we, it is very difficult to uh, differentiate between the invasive infection as well as colonization uh, from the surface cultures. And molecular methods need to support epidemiological linkage to pinpoint the source. Even if you can isolate the fungi somewhere in the hospital, you cannot directly link that to the case in that hospital unless you prove uh, that is molecularly related to it and difficult to determine the chance changing patient population and new sources of molds are coming day by day. And as Madam mentioned already, the surveillance data is not available in India for this particular uh, disease because it is actually a rare condition otherwise. Now, can we predict the source based on the initial presentation when the patient is inside the hospital? For example, the peritoneal infection points to the problems with the peritoneal dialysis, any catheters related to it, or bladder infection related to the catheterization. Continuous infection, the focus may be on the bandages, adhesives, or the fabrics. GI tract infections may be related to the contaminated oral supplements and medications. And site of transplantation may be because of the contaminated organ and surgical site infections because of the spores in the hospital environment uh, lodging into the open wounds or uh, near the bandage site. And pulmonary infection is because of the inhalation of these spores. 
and one thing is sure that single source may cause multiple presentations for example contaminated linen and negative pressure rooms may cause cutaneous infections as well as pulmonary manifestations now the bandages patches tape or adhesives uh, usually what we can uh, if you examine daily uh, the areas of adhesives or bandages you can notice the necrotic lesions appearing underneath and adhesive patches we are commonly using in the hospitals to attach the uh, intravenous lines a temperature probe or the heart monitor when the patient is in icu so we need to examine the site very frequently and under the tape uh, use it to secure endotracheal tube also that also can cause or uh, initiate the infection so uh, some authors advocated the use of tubings surgical tubings to fasten the or the fabrics to fasten the endotracheal tube rather than the tapes um, that is the opinion of some others who observed these cases more commonly with the tapes with the endotracheal tubes and whatever you do the routine skin checks will be helpful for earlier diagnosis coming to linen the contaminated linen can cause cutaneous as well as the pulmonary infections so in the hospitals we need to monitor uh, from the place of washing and while they are getting transported and where they are stored till they reach the bed of the patient and how they are being used in the hospital wards all these areas to be strictly monitored and the visibly soiled linen or the soil linen corks also can carry the fungal spores and higher maximum temperatures in in the in our country and relative humidity near the laundry that may cause the or the promote the spore uh, formation and poor ventilation in the patient areas or the areas where the laundry is stored and warm or humid indoor air in the storage area and sometimes we can also notice the thick layers of dust accumulating on the surfaces of the stored laundry these areas to be monitored carefully Now, there are some other possible sources in the hospital for example catheters and tubes or dental procedures or sometimes patients who are already diabetic may be using infusion pumps for insulin or um, uh, these things can cause infection or even the unsterile uh, practices of injections can cause also i can implant these spores into the skin so it is important to follow all injection safety practices especially among the diabetic patients and the air dust water and soil can also uh, may be nidus for fungal spores uh, for this we have to uh, keep on examining the air filtration and intakes of the air handling systems in the uh, icus and patient rooms and insufficient air filtration and air intakes that are near the ground for example the doors may be having the opening uh, above the ground so it may attract more dust into the rooms and uh, particularly when some outdoor air construction is happening or the exhaust even pull some air uh, from outside into the rooms these things have to be carefully monitored inside the hospital areas and poor maintenance of the air conditioning systems the filters are not cleaned properly uh, they may harbor the fungal spores that may dissipate the spores into the area and construction renovation activities around the hospital or icu can generate the large quantity of spores in the hospital environment that may eventually uh, break into the uh, wards as well as icus and many times uh, uh, we also notice the water leaks do happen during the um, um, in the hospitals and water damage because of the pipelines uh, we can see the damage suppose the bathrooms on the uh, higher floor we can leak the water uh, into the walls of the uh, lower floors uh, this moisture can harbor or can encourage the fungi to breed and fungal spores may be found there and also wet linen near to the wet walls can harbor the fungal spores and more important thing is you have to restrict the visitors because the movement of the visitors into the hospitals can bring more spores from the outside as well as the more importantly the plants that the floral baskets or the bouquets these also can carry the fungal spores and can get to the patient and as madam said already a team approach works best that includes a microbiologist internal medicine specialist intensivist neurologist ent specialist ophthalmologist dentist surgeon and biochemist all these people have to uh, work in conjunction as a team now uh, we will see how what are the issues related to the surveillance air surveillance in the hospital a epidemiological surveillance in the hospital it is not necessary in all investigations please remember that it can just add the weight of evidence about the exposures that increase the patient risk so that it can help the other patients and it can inform the recommendations for the patient care or for some remedial measures 
uh, how do how to do surveillance actually this uh, checklist is available on the website it is called the cdc targeted environmental investigation checklist for outbreaks of invasive infections caused by environmental fungi that is aspergillus or mycormycetes the checklist covers the following areas like general inspection for mold air leaks water leaks dirt in the hospital hvac systems uh, that is ventilation and air conditioning systems environmental cleaning that is happening properly regularly or not any construction activities or maintenance activities going on around the hospital uh, and line in how it is being managed inside the hospital uh, it has uh, uh, so many areas in the checklist it covers about uh, 20 to 30 pages checklist is there it covers almost all these areas uh, like this you can have uh, different points that should be inspected and noted in the checklist uh, by uh, properly doing this checklist i think we can identify the gaps in the hospital infection control practice and we can uh, do some corrective steps now uh, what is the role of the uh, aero mycological sampling or uh, environmental sampling uh, uh, for microbiological uh, uh, organisms we have to weigh the usefulness versus the cost and sometimes it may be misleading also but it should be a part of the larger building infrastructure assessment it cannot be uh, in isolated way can give uh, can't give any information it should be used in conjunction with other data regarding the infrastructure assessment for example if the microbiological results if it is positive it can identify the potential targets for remediation rather than definitive transmission routes it may not point to the particular patient or a particular transmission route but if you note any fungal spores you can do some corrective steps but if it is negative it cannot rule out that the spores are not there in the hospital at all it only indicates the spores are not present at the time of the sampling now uh, the questions do arise as when to sample how to sample what to sample what to do all those things uh, we'll try to see uh, uh, these things right pandit uh, pardon sir uh cdc uh, says that the routine random undirected sampling is not at all recommended and targeted sampling is required and definite indication should be there definitive protocols should be there and interpretation of the results comparing with the baseline value should be there and expected root cause analysis uh, has to be done and corrective actions should follow uh, these guidelines the elaborate guidelines are available in the website in the cdc website as environmental uh, sampling guidelines i will cover briefly what is covered in those guidelines the indications will be for example outbreak investigations uh, because i have to limit my presentation only pertain to mycormycosis but uh, slightly i will comment that outbreaks do happen in the hospital for example cluster and diphtheria outbreaks can happen or uh, surgical site infections all these outbreak investigations require the microbiological sampling in the hospitals and for research purposes or monitoring environmental hazardous conditions and to evaluate the change in infection control practices for example during the construction or the renovation activities or commissioning a newly constructed operation theaters or icus or assessing the change in the housekeeping practices or sometimes regularly also we have to do certain quality assurance programs for example uh, every month you have to submit the uh, performance indicators to the government uh, as a part of the quality assurance program for this also we do require the environmental sampling do happen in the hospitals water surveillance is not much important in case of the fungal spores as it is important for other diseases like bacterial diseases the portable water sinks faucet aerators showers toilets dialysis water ice water baths i wash stations dental unit water stations hydrotherapy units room air humidifiers all these can harbor the dangerous bacteria as well as some fungal spores and we can identify this by uh, membrane filtration bacteriological testing uh, and endotoxin detection and certain newer newer methods are there uh, luminometer molecular methods immunological methods like elisa immunoblot or chromogenic media so this is what happens in the membrane filtration we have to take a large quantity of the water here in the upper chamber and this passes through a membrane and uh, the vacuum is created in the lower chamber so all these uh, sterile uh, so called uh, water to be analyzed uh, will pass through this membrane after after that we have to take this membrane out transfer it to the culture medium and we have to incubate this culture medium then we can note the colonies that grow on this culture medium we can do or we can colony count also this is what to do in the part of membrane filtration uh, these are the uh, detailed guidelines uh, for water analysis available on the website 
um, so this is the link. Now the hospital environment is the mainly uh, the culprit in transferring the several infections, particularly the fungal infections. For example, the floors, walls, medical equipment, instruments, furniture, blood pressure cuffs, bed pans, pulse oximeters, crutches, all these things can transfer the infective agents. So surface sampling, it is widely practiced, but it monitors the inanimate environment and inadequate cleaning of surfaces can contribute to overall bacterial load in the hospital environment. So by doing the surface sampling, we can notice, we can identify that uh, whether the cleaning is happening properly or not. And surfaces are regularly contaminated, that is a problem. Uh, some areas may be uh, cleaned regularly, some areas may not be cleaned regularly. So the results we find through surface sampling may not actually uh, reflect what happens in the uh, ICUs or operation theaters or in the hospital wards. So it is unduly emphasized, but it is of uh, not much relevance in the actual practice. Now we'll see uh, what how the surface sampling can be done uh, to evaluate the routine cleaning and disinfection practices. So that provides a benchmark about the hospital infection control practices. And we can notice that whether cleaning is happening regularly or not. And also sometimes we have to detect the presence of specific nosocomial pathogens. For example, when you are seeing the outbreaks of uh, uh, extended spectrum beta lactamase producing organisms or uh, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, all these things we have to identify by using uh, these surface swabs. So there is microbial hygiene assessments. Uh, there are no defined acceptable limits about the colonies. But most of the authors agreed upon that about 2.5 to 5 colony forming units per square centimeter will indicate uh, that are the indicators for good hygiene. If any number of colonies, more than 5 colony forming units per square centimeter, indicates that hygienic practices are not good in that area. And one important thing you have to remember in the hospitals is timing and target sites to be changed frequently to avoid the change in the cleaner's behavior. For example, if the cleaning uh, people, the sanitation people notice that you always take swabs from the particular ward or particular area, uh, they tend to clean that area more often than the other areas. So we have to keep changing the areas often. So there are certain methods for surface sampling, the moist and swab with a direct plating and a direct contact plate method, that is Rodak plate method are the commonly used methods. There are some other methods also. Uh, this swab rinse method is the moist swabs rubbed over an area about uh, 25 square centimeters. For example, you can see in this area, you can have a square uh, with a, um, a defined area. You can place it on the surface that has to be swabbed. Then uh, moist and swab has to be streaked in that complete area. Then it has to be transferred to the culture medium. So this indicates about uh, a square centimeter if it is less than five colony forming units or if it is more than five colony forming units. So that indicates the hygienic practices in that area. Now dip slide method is another method where the agar coated slides are directly placed on the surface and that is transferred to the incubator. And you can notice the number of colonies growing in that particular, this has a different area and it touches a different area on the surface. You can notice the number of colonies in that particular area uh, that gives you a rough count about the colony forming units per square centimeter. The other method is the Rodak plate method. The Rodak plate is the replicate organism direct organ contact plate method. That is the abbreviation for Rodak plate method. Here, what we do is uh, normally in the petri dishes for use it for routine bacteriological uh, cultures, we do not fill it completely to the brim of the lower uh, part of the petri dish. But here in the Rodak plates, it is completely filled up to the brim of the plate. Then that the plate is inverted onto a surface and the surface comes into contact with the um, culture medium on the plate, that plate is taken back and it is covered with the lid and incubated. So here also we can count the number of the colonies appearing on the surface. Here is uh, how they will appear on the surface. So these are all different types of organisms. We can identify these organisms. For example, if some indicator organisms, for example, medicine resistant staph aureus or aspergillus spores or um, ESBL is present, we have to come, uh, report it to the uh, theater or the ICU so that they can take the corrective actions. Now, uh, we commonly believe that um, rather than the surfaces, the air could be a common source of contamination inside the hospitals. Uh, here, the personnel in the OTR ICU 
then more number of people uh, moving in the icus or in the hospital wards and how what are their practices what are their activities all these can reflect uh, about the microbial load in that particular area and are you allowing visitors into that area the more number of visitors uh, coming in the more number of spores or the bacterial count will be more in that particular area and ventilation type and air flow systems present in that area these also uh, will uh, influence the bacterial or microbial load and improper air filtration uh, do cause uh, many uh, outbreaks of hospital acquired infections uh, bacterial or sometimes even fungal so there are major airborne pathogens as i mentioned already is staphylococcus aureus uh, this is present in the dust as well as the skin scales of the patients as well as healthcare workers and mycobacterial tuberculosis may also be there fungal spores especially uh, that point of interest in today's presentation that aspergillus and mucarb uh, normally um, in the next uh, parts of my presentation i may be talking uh, in the counts as aspergillus spores uh, because the mucarb spores the quantification of the mucarb spores is not well standardized so the standardization of aspergillus spores uh, took place that way it is actually an indicator organism for fungal spores the count of aspergillus spores may also reflect the count of any other fungal spores that is called indicator organism for fungal spores and viruses also may be investigated measles or vzb may be transferred through through the airborne pathogens uh, there are some uncommon agents as well but uh, uh, we focus mainly on this fungal spores uh, there are diverse the standard guidelines are also diverse in different countries in different places and there is no international consensus about the uh, required or uh, recommended counts of these organisms but uh, we usually follow certain standard books like icmr as well as uh, bennett and beckman's hospital infections these have certain um, recommendations so in the next part of my presentation i will go through those recommendations only so when to sample how to sample what to use what medium what are the incubation times how much to sample and how often to sample in case of air when to sample for example in case of new icus or new or empty operation theaters after a maintenance work is complete or all engineering aspects have been dealt with we have to uh, initiate sampling at the time or sometimes you have to uh, sample the in use areas also in use areas may be sampled after in depth cleaning uh, making it dust free uh, visible dust free because we are focusing mainly on invisible things and along with inspection of the interiors air change rates and velocity are in order then we can initiate the sampling uh, these physical aspects to be corrected before we completely rely upon the microbial cultures now air sampling there are two widely used methods or popular methods one is the settle plate method that is passive method and volumetric air sampling systems using slit air samplers that is active method this is more accurate we will discuss these two methods in detail certain plates uh, these are just uh, petri dishes ha having a different kinds of medium for a different target organisms uh, we can use a petri dish with blood agar we can use a petri dish with nutrient agar meat extract agar or separate dextrose agar because we have we are investigating all kinds of organisms bacteria and fungi we can use uh, the combination of these media in any particular uh, zone and selecting media suppose you are ex you are expecting a particular pathogen uh, after following a surgical site infection outbreak uh, you, have, you can use the selective media only for, for that particular organism uh, otherwise we can use a combination of this normally uh, used media like blood agar nutrient agar and saborid dextrose agar these plates are pre incubated uh, this pre incubation is necessary to avoid any contaminants growing in the plates those contamination plate plates may reflect false reflection of the contamination in the environment so we have to use the sterile plates that are pre incubated the size of the petri dish is usually 90 mm that is microphone microphone uh, murthy please hold your microphone yes sir now is it okay sir yeah right sir so size of the petri dish should be about 90 mm uh, so that you can have a 65 square cm area and exposure time usually for uh, 10 to 60 minutes so there is some rough guideline that is one 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 rule that is you have to use uh, for 1 meter away from the walls 1 meter above the ground and for 1 hour that is the uh, broad uh, um, rough rule um, so this is how you keep the plates the plates uh, with the agar will be kept open so that the surface faces the top the lid actually um, covers uh, or rests on the edge of the lower portion like that you have to keep it for about 1 hour 
So where to keep this? So this is suppose a room is like this. Minimum five plates have to be kept like this on the four corners and in the center of the room. So this uh, this is a rough uh, plan of placement. You can uh, add more number of plates also. This is but the minimum required per room is about five plates. The counting will be after incubation. The counting will be direct counting. Are using a plate microscope. You can use uh, you can keep the plate under this uh, plate microscope and count the number of colonies. And um, these colonies are expressed as colony forming units are microbial carrying particles per square meter per hour. So we have to consider because you are using multiple plates, we have to use the average of all the plates for that room. So calculation of uh, index of microbial air contamination will be using this formula: colony forming units per square meter per hour. At rest, it should be less than 785 colony forming units per, per square meter. That comes to five colony forming units per plate, and during movement, it it is about four three thousand nine thirty colony forming units per square meter per hour. That comes to about twenty five colony forming units per plate. If you see any number of uh, more number of colonies than the recommended uh, number, you have to take some corrective steps in that area. So now we'll come to the intensive care units as well as ultra clean uh, operation theaters. the popular settle plates are not at all useful in these areas but if there is no other alternative uh, we can use settle plates but they are not useful or not recommended for the ultra clean areas surface swabs are not at all useful except in outbreak scenarios so the best method available is using a slit air sampler uh, this uh, uh, is a particulate sampling with an electronic sampler so i'll show you in detail what happens there it is a most efficient in uh, counting the microbial carrying particles uh, it can draw droplets as small as 0.25 microns in size this is a slit air sampler um, see it uh, it has some water attached to here uh, air is drawn from these uh, slits into the culture medium i will show the cross section also uh, this can be operated with remote also for example you want to close the area and examine it Uh, you can keep this machine inside and operate from the outside the room by using a remote control device so active air sampling times will be for example in the ultra clean areas or in intensive care units you can use for about 4 to 5 minutes up to 10 minutes also it can be used normal offices or households it can be for 3 minutes now what happens here the air is drawn through the inlets and uh, sucked into it by the motor and the when the air is coming inside it impinges onto the culture medium that is exposed there on the culture plate so any particles will impinge onto the culture medium and trapped there the rest of the air goes out uh, through back side of the machine so all the drawn in air we have we can decide how much volume of air is drawn through this uh, machine for that particular volume of air that is drawn into this uh, machine uh, how many Uh, microbes are growing on this culture media we can calculate easily so for this uh, there is some uh, uh, recommended quantities available for active surveillance uh, this uh, recommendations are uh, are applicable only if you are using the active surveillance method using the slit air sampler uh, or any other active surveillance method only not for set plate methods for example in the icus as i mentioned already aspergillus is indicator spore less than 5 spores it is satisfactory less than 5 spores colony forming units per cubic meter of air so if it is more than 5 spores it is unsatisfactory and you have to clean completely clean the area and check the air handling systems clean the air filters change the air filters if necessary then restart using the area so these corrective steps has to be taken in case of icus in the same way there are guidelines available for conventional operation theaters or ultra clean operation theaters the different uh, values are there these tables are available uh, when you are using the active surveillance systems you have to use the reference tables uh, for taking the corrective steps there is one uh, newer method uh, this is good for fungal spores that is um, for centrifugal air sampler the air is drawn through the side and it uh, rotates inside the machine so that it it has more surface area uh, is exposed the culture media is uh, uh, plated inside and the air is exposed for a long larger surface area so that you can trap or you can detect more number of spores so that is a centrifugal air sampler 
and impingement on the liquid media. This is also a method tried well for uh, fungal spores. For example, here, uh, the air passes through a chamber, the water vapor is added to it, the saturated air with the water vapor is added along to the air that is being sucked in, so that this water vapor uh, makes the spores a little heavy, so that these heavier spores uh, can trap easily in the culture medium when they're passing through the liquid. So this is called impingement um, on liquid medium model of air samplers. These are uh, less common methods, but this, uh, the previous one I spoke on that uh, slit air sampler is uh, widely available in almost uh, all the areas. It can be used for uh, fungal spores as well as the bacterial population. And another alternative is using an air particle counter. Uh, for each category of uh, clean room standards, uh, there are different sizes of the particles. You can uh, count each particle of different sizes. Uh, for example, for clean rooms, uh, there are different recommended values. For wards, there are recommended values. For waiting area, patient waiting area, there are the recommendations are there. By using this uh, electronic particle counter, uh, you can see the readings here and you can compare uh, with the values that is shown in the standard tables and you can take the necessary steps required to um, uh, correct that any problem is there. So these are the different kinds of uh, environmental sampling techniques. Now, when you are considering particularly for the spores of the mucorrhilis, uh, there are some issues with the fungal spores. As I mentioned already, settle plates are not at all recommended and small spores may not be pulled into the sampler due to the short sampling time. So if you are focusing particularly on the fungal spores, your sampling time in the active surveillance uh, method should be longer. For example, you have to pull the air for around 10 minutes rather than the recommended three minutes. And another problem with the mucor or any uh, rhizopus is the single spore can overgrow the entire plate if you incubate the plate for longer time. So this gives a false impression of, uh, or you cannot even do actually colony count also. For, for the same reason, you have to keep on examining the plate very often after incubation for when you are suspecting uh, mucorrhilis. And sampling results to be interpreted with caution. As I mentioned already, positive results and negative results may also be misleading if you don't know how to interpret them properly. And they generally indicate the gaps in infection control practices. Uh, one important thing you can do in the hospital settings is you can compare the spore count and the fungal profile between the indoor and outdoor. For example, you want to check the ICU. What is the spore count and the fungal profile, the fungi growing inside the ICU? And what is happening outside the ICU? You, if both are uh, in the comparable way. Suppose, for example, if the more number of spores are there in the ICU than the outdoor, that means uh, the hairy handling systems or the cleanliness in the ICU is not proper. So the, we have to uh, uh, also take the relative counts between the inside or indoor and outdoor sampling. That also has to be considered. And popularly, uh, the, over the last uh, few, uh, one week or so, the oxygen humidifiers are implicated uh, to cause the mucormycosis infections being seen now, but uh, there is no evidence for that. Um, we cannot talk on that until we get sufficient evidence and spores are uh, indoor and outdoors of ICU. So patient may be exposed anywhere not just while he's on oxygen humidifiers and spores do not spread from person to person. And uh, despite that, uh, we have some recommendations right from Island Institute of Medical Sciences to several state governments issued certain recommendations uh, that has to be followed when the patient is on the oxygenation. Use clean and sterile water for humidifiers during oxygen therapy and always use distilled sterile or RO water. This RO water sterility can be checked uh, as I mentioned previously by using the membrane filtration technique and never use tap water or unboiled water and fill up about 10 millimeters below the maximum fill line and water level has to be checked twice daily and topped up as necessary with the sterile water and water in the humidifier should be changed daily and humidifier should be washed in mild soapy water rinsed with distilled water and dried in air before use once in a week if it is for the same patient or in between for different patients if it is less than one week it has to be uh, completely um, all the components has to be taken out and it has been soaked in the mild antiseptic solution for about 30 minutes rinsed well with clean water and dried in air before we are using it again so these are the precautions we have to uh, take when you are using the humidifiers uh, the another important thing is uh, before uh, I conclude, 
I want to say that fungal spores are ubiquitous. We cannot completely blame the hospital environment for that, uh, but we have to keep the hospital environment clean by using the proper uh, aeromycological surveillance. And we have to need to address the predisposing factors well. Uh, it is the fertile soil that is a patient having more predisposing factors is more prone for fungal infections. And aeromycological studies in the hospital help to minimize the risk in the hospital. And we can also take the remedial measures in the infection control practices. Patients need to observe precautions inside or outside the hospital. As Madam already mentioned, uh, even at the home also, the patient has to use the mask and particularly when he's going out uh, near to the any dusty areas. And keeping a close watch, that is very much essential. Close watch and early signs is more important and to save the life of the patient because once initiated, it is rapidly progressive and uh, uh, endangers the life of the patient. And for this, you have to educate the patient about the early signs so that the patient, uh, even if he is not in the hospital also, he can examine, he can watch for those signs and he can report to the physician at the earliest possible time. With this, uh, I thank uh, the organizers for giving me this opportunity and thank you all for your patient listening. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Murthy. And I have only five minutes to wind up. Uh, so I'll quickly go through some of the chat questions here. Uh, it's questions which are there in the chat box. You can quickly answer them. Uh, there was a question on mucor plus cytomegalovirus infection. Is there any association? If so, when to suspect? That's the first question. Murthy, please take it. Yes, sir. Actually, um, see, once a patient is immunocompromised or an immunosuppressive, he is more prone for any kind of opportunistic infections, not just a mucor or any cytomegalovirus. But there are no particular surveillance data available for the co-infection or the super infections with these two. Uh, so, uh, I cannot comment on that, sir, at this moment. Yeah, okay. Then uh, the, there was a question on obesity, whether it is a risk factor. Obesity being the risk factor for many of the diseases. Yes, I think that exception for this as well uh, but obesity alone will not cause the mucor mycosis please Correct. do understand that Correct. And then, um, there was a question on double mass uh, whether they are protective there were no studies though we had uh, shown earlier that even the uh, cloth masks are also useful to some extent uh, but this double masking and all we do not have adequate uh, data on that yes. so there was a question on tapering of the steroids and the dosage of the steroids and it has been uh, it is being discussed many times that uh, 6 milligrams of dexamethasone for 10 days with uh, tapering that is used and a quick tapering is what is ideally practiced uh, then there was a question on ideal time for sampling in ICUs. So they basically would like to know when the samples have to be, to be taken in ICU with regards to the time in the day. Can you go and take that? Uh, yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Actually, there is no particular uh, guidelines for that. Actually, uh, the spores may be present. If, it, if they are present, they are present any time. Uh, one thing is uh, we can compare in two ways. For example, when there is no uh, movement in the ICUs, as I mentioned already in my one of my slides, when there is no movement at all, for example, all the patients are in the rest on the beds and only a few uh, healthcare staff are there. That is, you can take uh, one set of uh, parameters at the time. And when the parameter, when the, there is movement, uh, most visitors may be coming at the time also you can take sampling and you can compare both also. So usual, but usually the recommendations are at rest when there are not much movement inside the OT or in the ICUs. Uh, that is the actual recommendation. Okay. But for comparison, you can do uh, both times. Yeah, Th thank you. And uh, somebody asked whether the humidifier water, the water that is used in the humidifiers, be cultured to know whether there is uh, uh, there is uh, mucor mycosis in that uh, mucor um, in that uh, either spores or the hyphae, but. Uh, the studies have to be done to that extent, but what has been recommended has already been told by uh, TV Madhavi. So there was a question on how do you suspect early uh, in the in the society, in the field, uh, to know that there is a mucor mycosis case uh, because it is the COVID-19 cases are so rampant and uh, unless we know the, uh, the early signs, it will be very difficult to identify and take early action on that. Um, you have any take on that? Uh, actually, I think clinicians make an order better, better than better for this, sir. But uh, as of my knowledge, uh, the patient uh, can watch for any obstruction in the nose, as Madam told already, and any patches developing on the intravenous line areas. All those things you should keep a close watch. Yeah, actually, it is the nose, the stuffiness in the nose, or there is a discharge in the nose, or. Peri 
nasal swelling or if there is a numbness in the upper lip or the side, that side of the face, these are all the signs which should alert you that the patient is going for the infection. And um, then there was a question on whether methylene blue, if it is added to the humidifier, will it be uh, prevent uh, the contamination? Actually, uh, per se, there is no evidence that humidifiers are the reason for the um, uh, infection. And there are no studies related to methylene blue use in the humidifiers. Uh, yeah. So I can't comment on that. Sir. Yeah. Uh, with that, uh, we have come to the end of this session. And I thank all the speakers. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your elaborate presentation. Very, very informative. And I'm sure that we need more and more of such programs in future as well. And next episode, perhaps we'll be taking up on the surgery for the mucormycosis uh, by few of the experts. Uh, and uh, I once again thank all the audience who have taken part in this particular program. And my special thanks to Dr. Vinod Kumar AAS uh, for, uh, for recognizing Andhra Medical College to be able to do this particular program. And, um, and all the speakers have done excellently well and uh, I thank each one of you. With that note, I uh, close this meeting and we will meet again next time.